God, I'm telling you, the, the recording devices are getting more and more elaborate. Do you see the one the other guy had? It looked like a taser. Yeah, and then that one that had the prod, the probe thing, that was really, that was uncomfortable. Yeah, really. Just saying. So, wow, no one's asked us that. Fantastic. Um, well, it's a little early. I mean, in the con. I mean, what I what I generally found is that my ability to handle San Diego up to the point where I feel like I'm done is actually shrinking in direct in inverse proportion to my age. So at this point I'm 55 and I was pretty much done by Wednesday at 8:30. And yet here here we are again. Um, but so far it's it, so far it's been great. I mean I spent, you know, I just spent basically Thursday from 11:45 to 12:45 on a panel with Stanley and Mark Hammer. You know, uh, and I had Stan Lee telling the crowd that I'm one of the greatest writers in comic books. How can it not be a great convention when you have something like that happen? Yeah, that's, that's it was pretty epic. So you guys have probably heard everything from everybody at this point. So we don't we don't want to necessarily re you know reiterate. duplicate re reiterate. Um, are there targeted focus focused questions that you have, or do you want us to sort of just generally approach it? Blather. Sure. Sure. Okay. You want to go first? Uh, yeah, I'll go first okay, this go time because you went first last time. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, I'm doing a series called Head Cases. What happened was uh, not too long ago, a young producer I've known for a long time named David Uslan said that he felt that there was a market for a superhero sitcom. We'd go around and pitch it. And he said, I could see us doing something like the superhero version of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And I said, I could do that. And then I went and I actually watched uh, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And I said, I could do that even better. So um, what I developed, actually co-created with my wife, was a series called Head Cases. The concept is it follows the adventures, maybe too strong a word, of a young superhero named uh, Ari Cooper who goes by the name of Thunderhead. The reason he's called Thunderhead is because he's capable of generating seismic blasts of thunder by slamming his head against solid objects. The problem is that his head is not invulnerable. So the first time that he actually launches into action and attempts to thwart a bank robbery, he succeeds not in stopping the bank robbers, but knocking himself cold. The subsequent video of the bank robbers jumping over his prostate body, uh, prostrate body as he, as he goes running out, immediately went viral on YouTube, making him a joke to the entire community. Now feeling that there's no point in heroism at all, he just hangs out in a local bar called the DMZ that caters to both superheroes and, and supervillains. He generally just you know, spends most of his day hanging at a table uh, with, his, with a couple of his friends. One guy is a very hairy Chinese guy who fancies himself a descendant of the Monkey King. Uh, and actually calls himself the Monkey King, although his major power is throwing poop at people. Um, the other is a, um, a, a psychic named uh, Xander, who unfortunately, because he's constantly being pummeled with visions of the future, spends most of his time stoned, so he won't have to worry about it. Into the DMZ comes a young would-be superheroine who knows him from the old days when he was likewise young and upcoming and feels that he has lost his way and decides that she wants to try and bring him back into the fold of superheroing. Um, and that's kind of like the emotional underpinning of it. The, and what happened was, um, rather than going with television, David wound up hooking up with Marvel, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with Stan Lee's World of Heroes, and we brought it over to, to Stan's uh, YouTube channel. And I wrote what would essentially be a 75-minute movie that would be broken up, or if you will, season, that would be broken up into five-minute webisodes. I'm hoping at this point to have to feature as many cameos by various creators in the industry as humanly possible. And Stan Lee will be a recurring character. He will be playing the role he was born to play, naturally, Stan Lee. 
uh, he will be the equivalent of Norm. And that he walks in, afternoon everybody, stand! You know, that kind of thing. Oh, and I'm, I'm you know, really jazzed about that. So his introduction is when he walks in, everyone will stand and the bartender says, your usual stand? He says, absolutely. And she hands him two mugs of, hands him two mugs. One says beer, the other says non-alcoholic beer. And he holds them up in sequence and says, great power, great responsibility. Um, why not? It's Stan. Um, I'm also trying to talk Mark Hamill into being our Joker ripoff character. So um, I'm thinking that that would be a lot of fun if I can get him to sit down for an hour and put makeup on him. Um, but, you know, we're tremendously excited about this. And thank you. The other aspect that's going to be fun is that we really do focus on the nature of heroism. Being a bad guy versus being a good guy. Um, at one point, Jackanates, the Joker character, will put forth a very convincing argument for why being a bad guy makes way more sense. And I'm delighted by the notion of people sitting there and nodding and suddenly going, wait a minute. You know, so I'm hoping that uh, it will cause a lot of uh, fun and entertainment, be filled with the kind of in jokes that uh, comics fans like to be a part of, and uh, be a good fit for Stanley's World of Heroes. How am I supposed to follow that up? Um, well, our contribution is I've produced a uh, series called Fan Wars for the World of Heroes channel. Speak up, they're not going to Stanley's World of Heroes. There Sorry, I'm go. speaking up. There you go. Mid Sing fan out, wars. please. Mid fan wars, and then Stan Lee asked me to be the judge in it. Now, fan wars is a courtroom, a real courtroom setting, where, it, like Judge Judy or the People's Court, where instead of people arguing over who stole whose car, the arguments are classic sort of geek nerd game room arguments. Like the Flash is faster than Superman. No, he isn't. Yes, he is. You know, that kind of a thing. We've all had that. If you're in this geek universe, you, we've had those. So here's a formalized process sanctioned by the great Stan Lee, who oversees all, for people to come in and make their arguments. Now, they don't make their arguments to me, although I am the judge. They make their arguments to our celebrity jury panel. And the celebrity jury panel hears, and then they go off into and sequester themselves, and they decide who's presented the greatest argument. And they come back and level it down. And there isn't a prize at the end. You know what the prize is? Is you actually won in the court of Stan Lee. Bragging you're, you're, rights. You're, I mean, it's it's a legitimate. It's that's where you do it, right? So, and my job as the judge is to keep it moving, keep people in order. You know, um, do really you maintain the people. I, you know, it's like. You'll get people who, it's, it's really interesting because there's no, someone can come up with a great argument but a horrible presentation or they freeze up because there's cameras everywhere and then the other person sees that and then they just dig into them and get them all off putting. Now, you have to picture this scenario. Let's say you are a huge Batman fan. Huge. You know everything about Batman, but you're sitting in the audience because we have the audience, right? It's filled with fans and they're all cosplayed and they're all in it. And so you're sitting in the audience, huge Batman, but you're dressed as Batman. Now some dude comes in to make his argument, and his argument is, is that Batman can beat up Robin. And you're like, oh, this is easy, right? So he comes sits, then this other guy comes in, he's doing the counter argument. Robin can take Batman, no problem, he's never been given the chance, right? So he goes in, and then you proceed to watch your guy make the worst argument, miss, like, misquote, pick the wrong issue of Batman to point out, like, the whole thing, and this Robin guy is like, well, yeah, well, Nightwing beat this guy, and Batman couldn't be, you know, it just goes on and on, and then you watch the jury panel come in and say, you're right, we agree, Robin can beat Batman. So I, as the judge, was watching this phenomenon in the audience. They were just getting, just bent out of shape on these issues, on what was going down, because the people have to make the arguments, right, if they don't solve themselves, and um, so it's really great fun. Uh, the first episode came out last Monday, so you can check it out on, on the World of Heroes channel. Um, we'll probably we'll ramp it up in terms of the escalation of these questions, the, the you know the how the potential for for fiery debate you just will continue to, to rise. But I think it's actually a long needed forum for this kind of thing to take place in, and uh, we hope to with, through the show provide that and. and 
let people really participate in the conversation through the comments and eventually get on the show, you know. And so, so this show is actually encouraging bad behavior in the comment section of your videos. It's, dude, the, I was reading some of the comments in the first, on the first episode, because the first episode cover, we, we did a Spider-Man one because Spider-Man comes out as a movie and so we're talking about who was Spider-Man's real true love. Is it Mary Jane or is it Gwen? Right? Like, and, and, you know, there's, there's, ar- there's, uh, there's arguments between, yes. That's between what I said. that, you know, like, well, the argument is, well, Gwen, she liked Peter Parker before he was Spider-Man, so she likes him for who he is, not because he's a superhero, right, so that's the real true love for Peter Parker, and then you have the other one, well, no, Mary Jane, I mean, married, uh, there's a comic book, Peter Parker loves Mary Jane, right, the, hello, right, oh, no, but she only started dating him as a friend at first, so he was friend-zoned, and so, I mean, it goes on and on, right? So, so you watch that argument gets telegraphed into the comments section, and so it was really fun um, to to be able to be part of that. And you know, Stan enjoys. We're, after the after the ten court cases that we've done, it's become clear we need to have an appeals process. That was going to be my next question. Yeah, it, it's Will clear. There be an appeals process. There has to be. It has to. You know, so that means we got to have Stan come in and sort of personally weigh in and determine whether things can come back into the system. You know, <laughs> um, but it's treated that way, and you know, and I'm trying to. To, as the judge, keep it serious because it can go off the rails really fast, you know. Um, but uh, but, but it, there's a real function being served there, so that's I, I'm excited that it's on the channel. It's a, it's, it's a good one for for the, for the uh, people making arguments. They call witnesses. They call witnesses. They will they will um, submit evidence into the court. Like for instance, Mary Jane loves Peter Parker. Boom! I would like to submit to the court, and they got the comic right there, right? And then so the bailiff comes over. Grabs it, shows it to the celebrity jury panel. It's all, you know, and then and the other the other guys like, you can't do that. I didn't know you could bring stuff. I'm like, you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> I didn't know you could bring. Yeah, stuff. yeah. Oh, and then and then there's these things where someone will say something that's patently false, and the celebrity jury panel is allowed to question, you know, the validity of a statement. They don't just accept everything, you know. And so then once once they realize that what they said was not right, then you then you watch a sort of panic. We have this one guy literally freeze like his voice freeze like when he started to speak he, he said so uh, and I just like just and I and I had to yell boom with the hammer I have like Thor's hammer I go are, are you nervous sir you better get your act together because you're going to get your you know yeah, I'm sure that helped and it's, <laughs> <laughs> that it's put him right at ease it's, it's, it's great fun entertainment and um uh, you know, hopefully people will get a chance to know about it and tune in and just see what, what's going Does on. Does your rope come with a cape? No. It should. I know. You don't have a judge's rope? I have a judge's rope, but no cape. You need a cape. I have Thor's hammer. That's my gavel. You need a cape. Okay, you know I, what? You don't you, need it. You, you, you don't need to get into my courtroom? Yeah. And then and, and then start making your, your statements. And we'll see I'm not going to make a statement. I'm just going to bring the cape. No. See, you might get ejected right now. I had, I had to bounce two What are you, in the mode? No capes. <laughs> we, we had to bounce no two capes. people out with the bailiff. Not kidding. So uh, for, like, experts, like, could you bring, like, Peter in if you guys are doing anything about, like, a Superman could be the Hulk or something like that? We will we will populate our celebrity panel with, with experts as often as they're willing to come. Absolutely. No, no, I think he was meaning witnesses. Did well, you the, mean the, witnesses? The, the, well, uh, I, I do mean experts. Like you would, I would consider you an expert at the Incredible Hulk. So if somebody would be like, well, the Hulk could that or something. Like, would they be able to get like Peter, like you, to come in? Would they be able to get authoritative testimony? Yeah. Oh, expert yeah. testimony. Well, yeah. I mean, yes. If, oh, okay. if, but, of course, they could bring expert testimony, and that they would, would that would get it themselves. yes, they'd have to get it themselves. <laughs> but that would seriously have a huge impact on the likelihood of them winning, because the celebrity panel gets influenced by those things, you know, really quickly. It's like, oh, well, they've got the guy who wrote, oh, okay, well, I'm going to believe that, you know. Um, it's really interesting to see how far people will go. And I watch the escalation actually happen. It's, I mean, this is a very serious matter when you're talking about who the most powerful Marvel character ever was created, right? And you're gonna, then you get into this, well, it's the Beyonder. No, the Beyonder got retconned, so now it's this Cosmic Cube thing. I mean, it just goes, it's, it's real in there, you know? And, and, and I have a huge long history with uh, comic books collecting them knowing it both DC and Marvel because as the judge you have to be able to keep up with what they're talking about otherwise they'll just be able to float one right by you you know and actually the thing that's a problem is that most of the time the answer to it is always going to be it depends I mean you know who wins Superman versus the Hulk it depends how long does the fight go on 
because the longer the fight goes, the more the advantage swings over to the Hulk because there's no upward limit on his strength because the angrier he gets, the stronger he gets. If Superman can take him out fast and hard, then Superman can win. But it's kind of like it's kind of like a pitching duel, right? The longer a pitching duel goes on, the more the advantage swings over to the hitter because he's seen all the pitches. Well, that's true, but man, I'm telling you, arguments are like, so he says, you know, the Hulk can take Superman, and then the Superman player always is gonna say, well, they'll just pick up the Hulk and throw him into the sun. And then he's gonna say, well, the Hulk can just jump off the sun. And then, I mean, it just... It, no, my answer would be, I think picking up the Hulk and throwing him in the sun, number one, code against killing. Number two, um, Good luck with that, because I think the Hulk will have something to say about it. Well, you know, he, I'm going to call uh, graphic novel rules, so we can throw him in the sun, and we can kill him, and so we'll have a limited Graphic story. novel rules? I didn't, I didn't know there was that. In the graphic novel, you can just do whatever you want, and then pretend it never happened. <laughs> you know, it's an alternate. Um, it, see, but that's the, so that's the fun of the show, right? Yeah. Are you ever going to run into a mistrial, because there's no way Well, we did happen. have an upset. I don't want to give it away. But there was a clear upset, and the celebrity jury panel had to handle it. So there, there's definitely when you're wa there's going to be an episode you're watching where you're going to be like, no way. I mean, where where the arguments are, we're going to rub you the wrong way so bad, and you're not going to believe that it's going down the way that it is. And then there's a huge upset. So that's a good question that you asked there. Um, so yeah, so that's. You know, and how I became involved with uh, Stan is um, I produced this other show called The Jace Hall Show, which is kind of like Curb Your Enthusiasm for video game geek culture. Nerd. And we wound up going to visit Stan because Stan had called me, and I thought, I executive produced V, the TV series. I thought he was calling me because he wanted to make a TV show, but he actually literally called me over because he needed help with his Twitter. So while I was there, I thought I'd get my Hulk number one signed by him and he spills a cup of coffee on it and we got it on film, right? So that's how I meet Stanley, right? Um, and uh, how much was that comic worth? The so? comic was worth forty grand. But and Stan says it's, it's he says it well, Stan says it's worth more because no one had well at see, well there's another part to the story which is we went back with cameras to get him to sign the the restored, it's still wet kind of looking. And he had, uh, him and Gil Champion were in there relaxing. They had like candles set up. And the back of the comic catches fire. <laughs> and then, it, but Stan is like, dude, it's this is worth more money now because no one has a Hulk number one that's been like coffee spilled and burnt by Stan Lee in here on Sunday. <laughs> and so, I've got, I've got the, and so, that's how Rate I met him. that, CGC. That, that, that's, how, that's how I met him. And, uh, I mention this because see, the first episode of season five just aired yesterday of the Jace Hall show. And you should watch it because we recreate, we reconstruct Millie Vanilli. But if you remember that group, um, basically it goes like this. I'm playing Atari with Napoleon Dynamite, John Heater, and when people are playing video games and they lose, they always blame the game for the problem. So he starts to blame the game, and I start saying, don't blame the game, man, don't blame the game. I start singing to him, you know, blame it on the game, like blame it on the rain, and then it cuts into a replication of the Millie Vanilli music video, Blame It on the Rain, with me singing it, but next to me is actually Vanilli, like from, like, and he hasn't aged a day. Yeah, I have a, I have a picture I can show you. He hasn't aged a single day, and so we go through the whole thing, and then eventually uh, the music video gets cut off because the record skips, and we, we, we turn around and it's the original singer of all the Millie Vanilli songs. He's there saying, what are you doing? And so it's the first time you're seeing Millie Vanilli and the original singers together in a, in a, in a sequence. And uh, then we cut out of that we, we were back with John Heater and we sort of adventure through Diablo and you know various video games. But it's such an epic moment, you know, in, in, in the show. I wanted to mention it to you because if you haven't seen it, just for your own viewing amusement. amusement you should definitely uh you know check check that out but that show stan lee actually we went back and visited stan lee in our show this time and um because he wants to buy my comic from him like he he's who he, wants to buy the one he destroyed well, what, what happened was is he called me over there he actually had another hulk number one he said he felt bad and he wants to trade wanted to trade me a new hulk number one from my crispified wow. Hulk number one. So we wind up doing that trade on camera. So, really? Yeah. 
So, okay. you know, and, and it's, it's really interesting. I don't print this, but this happens in the show. You'll see Stan Lee shred the Action Comics number one. Right through Action a paper Action Comics number, number one? one? Superman number one. You'll see him shred that. Why? You'll see. Okay. <laughs> but but just the, I just ha- just have a replica this, or an. Action? I have a screenshot of Stan shredding, like because it, it, it's just like you've got it. It's such an epic thing, and there's such these overtones, you know. He 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 shreds that. He shreds um, the death of Superman. That comic. That that one. Uh, he shreds. Um, there's another, there's as another. long as you're not shredding X Factor, he okay. won't. He won't shred, shred a Marvel. Oh, thank God. He won't shred a Marvel. Um, I don't think you. I don't think you. I don't think you come back from that one. Yeah. He, so, uh, so, so it's great. But uh, definitely check out the Milli Vanilli. Look, we need to show you. Are going to be responsible for making thousands of geeks cry. Yeah. So um, that's what we're up to, and we're actually pretty excited about the World of Heroes thing. Uh, sorry, Stan Lee's World of Heroes. It's just a good. You know, Stan's a really, really. He's like all of us as far as he's just geek, he makes you know and so now there's this connection that he has that, that you can reach and, you know if you be identified as talent maybe for stuff that he's doing and um, it's just really, it's really exciting to see and it's, it's just one of those things where the internet technology has finally gotten to the point where to make to facilitate that you know I growing up I didn't quite have that couldn't you know but I can tell, tell you this he reads his Twitter if you want Stan Lee to hear what you have to say I am not kidding he reads his Twitter, so you can just tweet to him. Exactly, but he definitely reads that, um, and uh, you know I think that this is going to do wonders. Here's a lot of his ideas that he has, he's going to actually be able to get made now and not have to hit roadblocks, which is just good creatively. I mean, just these these two shows, I've, I've been waiting for something like this. For a long time. I'm actually kind of astounded that you've had to wait. I mean, I'm just flummoxed. Ever since channels started popping up on YouTube, I'm amazed that it's taken this long for someone to see the advantages and the and the frontiers that the internet offers for original original dramatic content. And particularly when it's going to appeal to the very people to whom the internet appealed in the first place. That it was kind of circular, but you know the concept that comics fans and geeks, if you will, are were the first big supporters of the internet beyond colleges, which is what it was first initial content was for. And thanks to them, it's it's spread and you know so vastly. I can't believe it's taken this long to actually put together a channel that is going directly to their taste and preference. I, well, I don't, I don't want to... Well, have, have there been others? I mean, no, 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 I understand that I'm a little new to this. I mean, it was a couple of months ago that Dave was talking to me about they're, they're going to be doing the Stan Lee channel, and I'm going, YouTube has channels? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I mean, I was one of the first people on the Internet. I was participating on Internet chat boards in 1985. So I do have some. He had a CompuServe account. That's right. I had a copy. I was on the. Uh, I was called. Email. I had use. I was Usenet. I was on the old Usenet accounts, if you remember. I had Usenet. I had CompuServe. I had Genie. Remember Genie? Oh, I remember Ooh. Genie and Quantum. Yep. Quantum, I never did. Quantum never did. becomes AOL. Yeah. You know, so I I have done it, but I didn't know that there were channels. Oh yeah. And, you know, and now that I know, but I now can't that, believe. Now that you know, you're long. you're making stuff for them. Hey, you know. As a writer, it's your job to try and go to where the fans are, and if they're moving over here, you gotta you gotta keep up with them. You're always reinventing yourself. Peter, I want to know what did you think of the Hulk in the Avengers? Oh, in the movie? Yeah, loved it. Abs- absolutely loved it because people always kept holding up uh, Bill Bixby's uh, David Banner as the best iteration, and there's a lot to be said for that because. In the first two movies, Banner's entire thing was going around being mopey and trying to figure out how to cure himself of being the Hulk. Well, you know he's not going to cure himself of being the Hulk, so his end game is pretty much hopeless. On the other hand, in the TV series, Bruce Banner, David Banner, I'm sorry, went around to place to place, and yeah, he was the Hulk, but actively seeking a cure for it was a minor. Part there were maybe a handful of episodes, 
most of the time he was going around trying to live his life and help people. You can, you can relate to that. You can get behind that. Here we had Bruce Banner in the Avengers movie essentially doing the same thing. Plus, he was the most well-adjusted Bruce Banner we've seen. I absolutely loved when he suddenly leaps at Natasha and she jumps out and pulls the gun and he goes and he basically says I was just fucking with you I'm sorry that was me you know um, I thought that was hysterical um, also it helps that Mark Ruffalo's face is so broad that it already has that kind of Hulk like quality to it because most of the Hulks particularly the dumb Hulk had that kind of like really broad look to his face, like if someone smashed it into the frying pan. So Ruffalo's natural features lent themselves well to the CG. Yeah, there you go. That looks like Mark Ruffalo. Lent themselves naturally to the CGI enhancement, so you felt more of that connection. So I loved Ruffalo's. I loved Ruffalo's banner, and I loved Joss Whedon's things that he tossed him at the Hulk, like the Hulk and Thor you know, manage to stop the creature and they both stand there and it's kind of like, then you kind of see the Hulk thinking, oh yeah, I don't like this asshole either. And he just, like, oh yeah, you again, wham! And he punches him and knocks Thor right off screen. And then kind of goes, like that. I thought that that, I thought that, that was terrific. And probably the best thing about it was the developing bromance between Bruce Banner and Tony Stark. How hilarious was that? That he, I, 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 I don't know if it's going to happen or not. It's probably not. I really think that Tony, that, that Bruce Banner should be in Iron Man three. Absolutely. Don't the chemistry between the two of them was fantastic, and it makes sense that these two characters would be buds because Bruce Banner is the only one who understands what Tony Stark is talking about at any given time. That's he true. speaks his language. He speaks his language, and I love when you, you know, I love how you turn into a giant green rage monster. Thank you. Jace, will we be seeing any comic book-themed music videos from you? That is an interesting question. Um, no one else has asked it. Congratulations. No, actually, got, no one else asked us about the, the Hulk either. I'm actually, I've been thinking about that for a while. I've actually been thinking about, right now I'm, I'm consumed a little bit with a Diablo one because the, the World of Warcraft one I did was pretty, like, but... The, the, the challenge for me is what if I do a music video that's surrounding heroes what, who would it focus on what, what does everybody want to see is it an Iron Man is it a Spider-Man or is it or is it more esoteric should I pick one that's not become a, a movie series of them. you know like a Doctor Strange why or? not yeah why, why limit yourself they're you hard to make <laughs> you can do one with the Hulk. Of course, it's hard to make. If it were easy to do, everyone would be doing it. The Hulk, the Hulk I, maybe the Hulk would be just because, from a musical standpoint, you have an expectation of it being like pretty beat oriented and pump up kind of a yeah. song, you know? That's a lot of things where I'm like mad. <laughs> no, that's, 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 that's an interesting. Um, I may do that. I may do. A lot of things rhyme with Hulk. Sure, way more than Spider Man. <laughs> Or we could do one where I, I talk about all of the heroes fighting each other. So you tell a story about, you know, like, the Hulk woke up and punched Spider-Man, and then Spider-Man went and got back, you know, whatever. It is. So, um, I don't know. I don't really think about that, but, I, you know, I, I, it, had, it had occurred to me to, to do that. We, uh, we play your Street Fighter song on our show. Yeah, uh, Machinima sent it to our yeah, radio station. Yeah, so. It's awesome. So you heard it. Well, I just released... All the songs that we've ever done for Jay's Hall show for free up on SoundCloud and all of the instrumentals. And um, so if you want to grab them, just look them up because it just came out like two days ago. And so you can get the instrumental for Street Fighter if you want it. Um, and, uh, or I play WoW. And, well, one thing I have coming up is a remix, a new redo done version of the I Play WoW song. I think people will appreciate it. It's a little more epic. Um, so that'll be out soon in Pac-Man Fever, and so, uh, yeah, we we'll work on it. Okay, I, th I think we're being told we're done. We're out, we're getting, we're getting booted out. I, it depends, what are you about to pull out? Oh yeah, okay. Huge fan, thank you. Wow. Thank you. Wait, you had yeah, something to do with that? I had nothing to do with it, but when, it, when it's, when it's a character-centric book like this, then I'll sign it. 
because um, I've, I've, had, I've had people hand me stuff that I never wrote, never saw, course, right. and they get pissy when I won't sign yeah, it. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of my favorite comics of yours was at the end. Oh my god, oh, thank absolutely, you. without a doubt. Thank you. Oh wait, did you want me to make it to you? Oh, okay, there you go. <laughs> Dear eBay. That's right. Dear Geek Rod. Actually, it was, fu it was funny how the end came about. What happened was is that Bobby Chase called me and she said, we're going to be doing a series of books that's supposed to be the last adventures of certain characters. And it's going to, and we want to have them written by and produced by the creators who are very associated with the characters. And the first one we're doing is called The Hulk. And we want to know if you would like to do a comic book that's the last Hulk story. And I said, well, here's the problem. I've already written a story that was intended to be the last Hulk story. It was called The Last Titan. It was for a short story collection called The Ultimate Hulk, which, by the way, is no relation to The Ultimate Hulk, you know. And I said, I don't think I can really top that one. It's a story about the end of, you know, there's been a cataclysm, and the only thing that's left in the world is the Hulk, Bruce Banner, and, you know, the two of them, and giant mutant cockroaches, and that's it. And she said, well, we own the story, because, you know, it's a short story collection that was our character, so would you, can you turn that into a comic book? And I said, okay. And what was interesting was that the original story was very cerebral. It's the whole thing is essentially stream of consciousness going through Bruce Banner's head, with occasionally the Hulk interjecting, and that's it. And it's him just wandering around a desolate Earth thinking to himself. Well, let's turn that into a 48-page comic book, shall we? It, it actually was one of the most challenging things I've ever done, taking that really cerebral story and making it appealing visually. And, uh, and I was incredibly lucky because Dale Keown just knocked it out of the freaking pot. I mean, he just, he just nailed that sucker. Well, now it's time to eat with Anne. There is a hump day, it's safe to say. We'll have some fun today on Geek World Radio.